As y'all know, I come to y'all with the hot tea and the good real spill. I am your girl, the one and only Bruja Honey Ray. And you can find me on TikTok at Bruja Honey Ray 222. Also, make sure you like and subscribe this for this video, you feel me? Before we get into all the good details, you feel me? On, let's get into Chris Stokes and B2K and the allegations around Marcus Houston. Now, I have been on their ass for a minute, and I'm on Chris's head, you feel me? And I am releasing the interview from what they had from CMX Division. And I just want to, I'm going to play the clip, and then I'm going to also read you all the second part of that interview that is going to hit the fan. Things like our parents slowly like drifted out of the picture because, you know, then it went to a point where it was so personal. It's like, you know, you know, we love y'all over here more than our parents love y'all, you know. And then, yeah, then, you know, we never, you know, it was, it was, a, good, it was a good thing, you know. You, you're, 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 you're a young kid, you're surrounded by all this money, you know, you're surrounded by somebody that's, you know, uh, you know that's, I guess, had a little success in the industry. And you're like, okay, oh, cool, I don't want to make anybody feel, you know, funny, so, well, all right, well, I'll stay over here, or I won't go home and chill my mom this time. Yeah, it was like to a point where, like, you know what I'm saying, what you going home for, like, we couldn't, we couldn't even go home, you know what I mean? It's like pretty much it went in the direction to where we he scared had, to ask he had control over our lives. We were scared to go home. So tell me, what kind of effect did it have on your home life, your parents, your friends? Because it had to be dramatic, you know, to whereas the management's got control over you, just pitting you against the parents or pitting you against your friends and things you don't even know because of your young age. How was that feeling? I mean, what, it was, what, what was happening? It, it was definitely crazy. You know, parents got emotional. You know, several several times because it was it was several you know um, arguments and you know mothers crying and stuff like that. You know, you can you know we got our parents and get the people to vouch for that. You know, um, was, they feel like they their sons was being taken away from them. It was, it was wow. It was it was definitely it was crazy. It was definitely crazy. It was to the point where if we wanted to go home, we could only go home for like a day and a half, and we had to come back because you know what I'm saying. He didn't trust us at home. You know what I'm saying? Or he would make some business, you know, thing pop up. Pop up to where we had to get back. So I gotta make sure I get back. We couldn't go there, you know what I'm saying? Or like, he would set up trips to go to Lake Arrowhead on, on Christmas. Yeah, that we had off. You know what I'm saying? And then it's like, basically, the relationship was set up like, basically, you tell me everything, you be my best friend, you gonna get everything. You know what I mean? It was like, it was like that. So we was, basically trying to stick around because we didn't have no money, you know what I mean? So we was just like trying to get money where we could get money at. But at the same time, we wasn't noticing that, you know, he was, he, was, a little naive. he was keeping us away from our family. So our families couldn't educate us on what was going on because our family was seeing through it. But we would only have phone conversations. So when we had phone conversations, if our family started going into it, we didn't want to hear because we had already been, you know what I mean, brainwashed on this end on what was really going on. And, what our parents was gonna say, and you know, it was honestly crazy because what he would tell us our parents was gonna say, they would actually say it. So he would already pre prep us to where we wouldn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? We'd be like, nah, you just don't know what's going on. You know what? I gotta go. I, I some day call. I gotta go do a radio drop. You know what I'm saying? Lying to our parents so we wouldn't, even, you know what I mean? We wouldn't even have to entertain the conversation. <laughs> and then it's like, I just wanna, I just wanna touch on something real quick. You know, O did an uh, interview. The MTV, MTV, you know what I'm saying? And he made a comment, you know, I got a house, I got a car, you know what I'm saying? I got a, I got a Jacob, you know, I got earrings, I got a house. Let me, let me be honest with y'all, that nigga lying, he ain't got no house. That's got Marcus no house. Houston house. That's Marcus house, I used to live in that house before I got kicked out, but we'll get to that later. That's that's Marcus Houston house, Amari paid to have furniture in a room. He doesn't own that house. Not even the master bed. He doesn't even have the master. He has a Jack and Jill room that connects, but it's not the master bedroom. His car's not paid. That's, I mean, let's not go into personal business, but you know what I'm saying? He's trying to cover it up, saying that, you know, he got money, where did, where did our money go? Let's set the record straight, we got money. But that don't mean we got that, we don't, that don't mean we got what's entitled to us, you know what I'm saying? Just because you got a, got here, you got a hundred thousand there, you know what I'm saying? That don't mean that you got all your money. As a man, we, as men, we want 
everything that's due to us. We work for it, give it to us. Don't just give me, you know, one fourth of it. Respect. You know what I mean? It's respect. It, it has to do with respect, factor because all you got in this world is your name and you know your word and, and the respect that people hold for you. If people see that they can run over us, we're gonna be a, we're gonna be a, the the targets of the industry. Colgate will be the case because we can take all that money and they won't say nothing. You know what I'm saying? So let's get into the second part of that interview. It says it all started with Fizz when he was eight years old and he was in a group called Melodic along with his cousin Ja. Melodic was formed by Dave Scott who later became B2K's choreographer. Dave Scott who is which a well-known choreographer in the industry and his partner Keisha Gamble. Shout out to Keisha Gamble because she started Mindless Behavior which I love to this day under new new management over time members changed because parents weren't feeling the project finally at the age of 13 boog and raz came into the group boog was brought in by keisha gamble boog's mom used to babysit keisha's niece and she asked if boog could sing or dance marcus had nothing to do with him becoming a part of that group this said group b2k let's let's clarify again y'all Marcus Houston had nothing to do with the group B2K forming. So at that point, the group was Fizz, Buzz, and Raz, Trey, and Ja. Omarion has not entered the picture yet, okay, as we go down in the history. They auditioned for Universal, Arista Records, and even Sony and Epic. New New Management and Dave McPherson, with some help from Chris Stokes, helped them shop labels finally chris decided to take trey and ja out the group because they were growing taller than fizz and buzz bug and raz and which causing them to look older than j bug rad little fizz and raz b so he he wanted a younger more group or more appealing group as you can hint and see he wanted you know he wanted the older kids out so Trey and Ja left on good terms and started a group called Final Four that in that is now signed with the MCA Records. So the guys that he um you know parted away from the group, they came out with a group called Final Four, which they later on signed to MCA Records. Dave Scott found Omari, not Chris Stokes, as originally thought. So yes, everyone that thought that Omari Young was founded by Chris Stokes and he how he discovered him. No, let's put this to rest. Chris Stokes stole these boys from Keisha Gamble and Dave Scott. Let's be real clear on that, okay? So Dave Scott eventually found Omari and introduced him to the guys at Marcus Houston's 18th birthday party. Okay, this is how he got introduced to the crowd. It was at Marcus's Houston's 18th birthday party. I.e. letting y'all know that Marcus Houston and Omarion are not Sakin. Because if they were Sakin, he would have been introduced to the group before Marcus Houston's 18th birthday. They vibed with him and they went on to sing and dance for each other. They liked the chemistry, so they added Omarion to the group. They brought Lil Man from Third Thrower into the group, thinking maybe a strong vocalist would help them and get signed. But the chemistry wasn't there. They got along on a personal level, but his performing style didn't fit the group's image. Okay, so Omari, he fit with the group, but this other guy called Little Man from Third Story, they wanted to bring in a strong vocalist, but of course, you know, they were vibing. So Chris brought Raz, Fizz, and O and Book off to the side and told them that he was phasing out Little Man. They went on to perform for, um, Tease, 3LW's manager. Tease was really feeling them and couldn't understand why a record company hadn't picked them up yet. She had them to go to Beverly Hills to perform for her partner. And from there, they set up another audition with Sony in New York. They went to NY to audition for Sony. And at this time, they got signed. That's where it all started going downhill. But they didn't know it yet. 
Chris had them sign a production deal with TUG before signing the recording contract with Sony, i.e. this is how he locked them in to get under his control. First you signed the contract with me saying I'm your manager, I have control of your say so of your performances and things like that. Then you could go on to sign with Sony getting publishing rights and you know studio time and things of that nature. It says though, they all felt at the time that this was the best thing to do because having a production company behind you helps move things forward with the record label. Chris Stokes hired an attorney for the guys, Stan Diamond, who was found through Michael Houston, Marcus Houston's father. In the beginning, everything was cool. Their parents were very involved with their careers and they built a strong, trusting relationship with TUG. The members of B2K relied on Chris's guidance and put a lot of their and put a lot of their trust in him as well as Marcus and Taz. As time went on, they gained more and more success. They were offered many new contracts and endorsements. Daryl Houston, Jay Boog's father, which this is Daryl Houston and Marcus Houston. Um, fathers are Sakan. This Jay Boog is Sakan to Marcus Houston, not Omarion. All right. Jay Boog's father insisted on having their own lawyers check out the contracts to make sure they were fair and sound. This is when TUG started pushing him away, stating, Your dad doesn't know what the F he's doing. So they blatantly told a child. 13 year old 14 year old kid that your parent don't know what the f they talking about what the f they doing when they talking about i need to bring another lawyer in to make sure my child is protected i.e that's how chris inserted his control they said when mr houston insisted chris's comment was i am make science contracts without getting lawyers involved most of the time they don't even read them they just sign them i.e that's the most important part is to read the contract and and understand what you signing your name over to and who you're signing your name over to and what you are agreeing to on that dotted line now they say keep in mind the boys were only 14 and 15 at the time didn't know the business side of things and just wanted to perform and do what they love doing so they put their trust in chris daryl houston was kept away to make sure they never got their own lawyers and everything continued to come through the attorney that was hired by chris and michael houston which michael houston once again is marcus houston's father According to Raz and Fizz, whenever the guys asked to have their own lawyers, Chris would make them feel guilty. As Fizz says, he would be like, oh, what, you don't trust me? Pulling that narcissistic role. They were never allowed to have their own lawyers and were never allowed to check their own books for themselves. Like Omari claims he did, but there's more on that later. The boys now feel that it was planned all along to keep their parents at distance so they wouldn't catch on to what was really going on. They were told things like, we love y'all more than your parents do. Whenever you, they asked to go home to visit their fam families, Chris would ask, what you going home for? Says Jay Boog. He had control over our lives. We were scared to go home, stated by Jay Boog in that CMX interview. Their parents were becoming more and more emotional. They felt that their sons were being taken away from them. Whenever Chris did allow them to go home, according to Raz, he always scheduled some time, some type of meeting or business that would bring them right back to Chris. So this man would come up and make up these sort of scenarios to where the boy, oh, the boys got to go do a show or the boys got to do a, a fan signing or they got to do this interview just to keep them away from home, which i.e. distancing them from their parents, causing a rift between them and their parents. So it says their families were being beginning to see through it, though. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So let me go back. Okay, right here. Their parents were becoming more and more emotional. They felt that their sons were being taken away from them. Whenever Chris did allow them to go home, according to Raz, he was always scheduled some type of relationship between to become between the boys and become about the power that he had over them and their relationship. Chris insisted that the boys communicate only with him and keep their conversations secret from the others. As Boog puts it, you tell me everything 
you be my best friend and you get everything. Chris basically used each of the boys against each other. I.e. the good old plotting everybody against each other to make things happen and move and shape for your own benefit. Their families were beginning to see through it, but were helpless to stop it. When their parents would call and try to tell them what Chris was doing, the boys didn't believe them. Chris had succeeded in brainwashing them, but they didn't know it yet. When their parents tried to explain how Chris was using them or lying to them, Chris would immediately rush them off the phone, saying that they had to go do a radio drop or interview, like I said before. To stay on Chris's good side, the boys felt that they had to come to him and only him. They hid things from each other because if you were on Chris's good side, then you got clothes and special attention. They were not a group anymore. They had basically become four individual entities that were spying on each other, says Fizz. We were all during doing different things, but we kept it from each other to stay on his good side. If one find out, they'll run and tell just to get brownie points. And that's sad. According to Raz, Chris made it very clear that he intended to stay in control and would not hesitate to use the boys against each other. Raz called with the saddest look in his eyes. Chris said, I can make your boys turn against you. Mmm. Raz recalled what he told to, what Chris told to his mother. Oh no. Let's clarify that. I'm clarifying what Chris told to Raz B about how he could make the boys turn against him. I.e. when Raz B made those allegations against Chris, look how the boys turned against him. He says, but I don't want to do that. That comment is stuck in my head, says Raz. It never left his head. So Chris Stokes had accomplished what he set out for. B2K was no longer communicating with each other, only with him. He was controlling every part of their lives. Do this, do that, say this, say that, eat this, eat that. Yes, he told them what to eat, y'all. Says Boog, he told us we couldn't eat chicken. Our parents were like, what the hell is wrong with y'all? They were only allowed to eat turkey or fish. If they wanted a burger, it had to be a Boca burger. And if they didn't do exactly what as they were told, in Raz's words, it would turn into a big powwow. It says when they got out of line in Chris's eyes, he enlisted Marcus to um to vigorous stuffy beat. To a vigorous stuffy beat them with comments like okay so i get what they're saying so vigorously he would beat them with comments like you disappoint me you're not immature you'll never be like us so marcus would say be saying that and if they said just to note raz became very angry telling this part and responded to you're not immature by saying fuck immature excuse my language he said emotions were high at this time during the interview. So, yes, during that interview on CMX, the emotions got very, very high as they continued to talk about Chris and Marcus Houston and TUG and Hook Productions. So, then Boog equated TUG to a cult. He said they looked up to Chris as if it was a matter of all masters and trusted him even though he made them angry, says Rat. Okay, angry. Raz says it was a whole brainwashed manipulative situation. To elaborate, Fizz mentioned a time that he and Book got in trouble for falling asleep at the movies. They went to see Lord of the Rings and Chris yelled at them for falling asleep and missing the end. Oh, that man was so controlling, possessive and obsessive. He wanted them to see the ending because it showed the meaning of true friendship. How so? These are the kinds of things the boys were being exposed to. Let's say that again. These are the kinds of things they were being exposed to. On the subject of money, Boog stated that they got paid for spot dates like radio station shows, etc. But they did not get paid for major tours during Scream Tour 2 with Bow Wow. Tour uh, accountants made comments like, I hope you know what you're doing. These numbers don't look right. I.e. meaning somebody was stealing from the camp and stealing from their people. 
So B2K was becoming an entity that was in a popular demand, but many people in the industry did not like or respect Chris Stokes. They only dealt with him because B2K was hot at a hot item, and the only way to get them was through Chris. Remember on 106 in part, um, Chris mentioned that he loved the love he was getting. It went straight to his head. Mm. Okay. But I know he did. He had a big head. Chris Stokes has a terrible reputation in the industry. He is not liked or reported by his peer or respected by his peers. Period. He used B2K's success to boost his own image, i.e. the big head, just to get money off of them. The bigger the guys became, the more people were telling them things like, watch your money, or if you had your own lawyers, your pockets would be a lot better and you would not be roommates with your friend or crashing at other people's houses if your money was right. Okay. But the boys believe in Chris like a father and dismiss the things that they were being said. So, of course, once again, Chris's manipulation over the mind got them all misconstrued. Okay, so Chris, Marcus, and Taz had taken full control and the guys didn't know how deep they were being used. The houses and cars you saw on MTV Cribs and how I'm living, they were all in Marcus's, Rome, and Chris's name. And if y'all, I'm referring to Rome from I Am X, I will show you a picture of who Rome is and I also include the video of BT How I'm Living. Not B2K. So none of that stuff y'all seen on B2K, how I'm living all that. That was not in B2K's name. That was not in none of the boys' name names. It was in Marcus's name. It was in Rome's name. And it was in Chris's name. The boys pooled their money to furnish the houses. But it was done off the record. So they don't have proof of it. All because they trusted their managers. The boys did speak on Omari's comments on TRL. Remember when Omari said, I have a house, I have a car, I, I have a Jacob, I have earrings, I have money to play with. Boog's answer was, that nigga lying. <laughs> he said that nigga lying, period. He went on to explain that the house and car he was referring to are in Marcus Houston's name, not Omari's, and the car is not paid for at that time okay all of this is alleged the house omari paid to furnish his room and his room only but nothing else omari doesn't sleep in the master bedroom he sleeps in the jack and jill room that's connected to the master bedroom mm. why do they have a jack and why'd you sleep in the jack and jill bedroom uh -uh. Bull would know he lived in that house until he was kicked out. Okay. Let's get into more of this interview. It says Boog says Boog also wanted to make it clear that B2K isn't broke. They do have money, but they only have a small fraction of what they actually earn, says Boog. As a as a as men, we want what's owed to us. I work for it, give it to me. Right. Because you know, give them their millions that they're owed. They said, how did they find out what was really going on? Okay, this is where we get into how they found out what was really going on. They said, well, according to Raz, when the boys um started seeing that things weren't adding up, they asked questions, knowing that a lawsuit could be around the corner. Some accountants started fessing up. Remember back in the beginning where Chris had the boys sign a production deal with TUG, y'all? Before signing the record deal, well, that means all money is distributed through the production company. What should have happened was that a check would be cut and distributed between production and the boys. Well, the checks were cut, the checks were cashed. Only a small fraction of what was supposed to be distributed to the boys actually made it to them. They couldn't really go into detail about that. I'm sure their lawyers are now investigating, so don't be surprised if Bull, Grads, and Fizz take TUG to courts sometime soon. Which this this article was back in 2004, and they had took if they had took them to court yet, yeah, they ain't gonna never take them to court because 
Boog and Fizz are still in the pockets of Chris Stokes and Taz. And Fizz sits on Taz's art club board as of today. And Art Club is a production, music production company. Y'all should go look that up. The boys are, um, the boys also commented on Omari's claim that he took his lawyers and checked all of his books. Frankly, they say he has to be lying. And this is for two reasons. First, he doesn't have his own lawyer. Remember from the beginning, none of them were allowed to have their own lawyers. So what lawyer did he take to TUG? Second, anyone knows about anyone that knows about business knows that it takes more than one day to audit a company, especially one the size of TUG and the amount of money we're talking about. In short, it is not possible to have audited the books in that time, Omari claims. The boys didn't say it, but my personal opinion on this is that Chris continues to brainwash Omari, and that's where he cl- he his claims are coming from. So at that time, Omari was brainwashed by um, Chris Stokes, and you know, being manipulated and being underneath that um, grooming of Chris Stokes at that time in 2004. Um, it says here, Fizz also had an answer to Omari's implication that Fizz's solo album helped lead to the breakup. Omari stated on TRL that it was time for a split because Fizz is doing a solo album and we're growing up and wanting to pursue different things. Fizz broke down the real deal spill. Okay, he says that he was forced focused on his solo project, but only while they were filming, you got served. Fizz didn't have a big part in the movie, so weeks would go by and by by at times that w- that he wasn't working so Fizz is saying during the time that you know he only had a small role well why not let me put out a solo album while the group is working on that you know put out some of my music so that wasn't really the cause b2k wasn't working on music at the time they were filming the movie so yeah so he took that time to concentrate concentrate on his solo album after the movie shoot wrapped he shifted his focus right back to b2k book was in the studio with fizz almost every night he was there even if they went from 4 p.m to 4 a.m raz came through to to lend his support the boys stated in the interview that jealousy had nothing to do with it unless it was in fact omari who was jealous at that time it wasn't until the end of ST3 that the boys really stated communicating again. They were beginning to notice things they hadn't noticed before. At the end of each tour, Chris, Mark, and Susan, and Taz would have fat pockets, houses, and cars. And B2K themselves didn't have much more than they had when they started. If it was B2K making all this money and doing all this work, why was everything reaping the ben- why was everyone else reaping the benefits except them? They were beginning to see the light and realize that it was in fact B2K that built TUG Productions, says Raz. Marcus Houston said stated by Raz, Marcus Houston has a little bitty career because of B2K. <laughs> and which is true. Okay. This is all allegedly, but this is also public record. He says, we're the reason Janae is out there. And this was back in 2004. He's referring to Janae Aiko. He said this, he said this not to sound conceited, but because they were beginning to realize that Chris and Marcus were piggybacking off of B2K's success. Chris even suggested that Marcus Houston make points off made Marcus Houston make points off of B2K's album. I.e., he was getting residuals from these guys' album, and he ain't have not a lick of talent on there, not a lick of writing, contribution, singing, dancing, or nothing. And he getting residuals off of these boys' music. He should be ashamed. Chris even suggested that Marcus Houston makes points, like I said before. So, Chris even, um, also, this didn't make any sense 
at all to the guys and this was one of the reasons they were becoming suspicious. One more thing that came about because of B2K that MH piggybacked off of, you got served. This was the point of the interview that Fizz's anger really came through. Fizz explained that the reason this um, Screen Gems executive was interested in the You Got Served project was beca all because of B2K, period. Fizz also go on, goes on to say he knew who B2K was, but he did not know who the F Marcus Houston was. From not one video, not one effing video, but Chris insisted on pushing Marcus Houston into the screen. And he um, insisted on pushing Marcus Houston onto screen gems, and they didn't even know who he was. When things began to surface and the guy started going to Chris, his reaction, according to Raz, was, I'm the king of black boy groups. I'll just create another B2K, which you cannot. You should mark your words. Like, be careful what you say, because you ain't going to never create another B2K, because you will never get that shine and that light ever again, because the light we shining on you today is justice, and these boys that see justice, Raz shall seek, see, Seek and see justice for his truth and what he was trying to warn everybody about. So at the end of part one, Bullock left us with the question with B2K being as successful as they were. Why was B2K not able to afford those houses? But suddenly Marcus, Chris, and Romeo were? That is a good ass question, okay? A good ass question. So, y'all, y'all see what I'm saying uh, uh, about this Chris Stokes scandals and things of that nature and why I went so heavy on them. Because we got to stop letting this stuff, this type of stuff slide. You feel me? We can't let this thing slide in our community no longer. We can no longer swipe the under the rug of big people, our people being abused and then children being abused at a young age and then it affecting them as adults. So we have to shine a light on this. Like I said before, Chris, I'm on your, eh, I'm on your booty, boy. I'm on your booty, okay? And with these allegations, y'all take with you know, it ain't even allegations. These are written, this is a written transcript from what the boys stated in their interview in 2004, around the time they broke up. So you all take this knowledge and do your use your discernment and do your due diligence and research and learn about what is really going on. Don't use speculation. Go and read these blogs from back in the day. And you know, check the facts, check the facts. Because the, the proof is in the pudding. And the proof is everywhere what they doing out here. And um, I want to end in on that note with that. And also, Diddy is with these women because that's a beard. Let's, let's, let's say that. I want to say that on Diddy. He's, he's doing that because that's a beard. And there's a lot going on out here. From, and then with Lil Fizz and allegations of his allegedly his booty being all on twitter and stuff that just goes to show more proof in the pudding baby you liked it from the beginning you know what i'm saying sorry to say that but at the same time let's be real you kind of when you was exploring your sexuality with chris and and, and at that young age as a boy you kind of you kind of enjoyed that you you liked it so yeah that's just more proof in the pudding y'all and i hope y'all enjoyed today's episode you know what i'm saying i'll be back consistently on youtube and giving y'all some more real tea real spill facts you already know and also make sure y'all check out my podcast methods of madness i just posted a new episode titled being comfortable in your solitude so go over there and get y'all some good gems because you know your girl be dropping all the good logical and knowledgeable wisdom on y'all so make sure you go like this video share it share it share it subscribe to your girl make sure you tell your people to subscribe to me tell a friend to tell a friend you feel me and bring in the soul travels because this is gonna fall on the right listening ears i'm your girl bruja honey rain the hood spiritualist tuning in to y'all what y'all got going on but i'm tuning out right now on this recording because i said love and lights everywhere Peace.